I will skip that, but I just summarized it. Let's talk about um, Sing Chu now. Here's some pictures of some people living in a very small system. These are some uncontacted tribes in Accra State, Brazil, close to the border with Peru. Said, quote, we did the overflight to show their houses, to show they are there, to show they exist. So some people still live in a very local way, unconnected to large major religions that we have, with their own local environmental identities, typically worshiping local environmental contexts. And this picture helps us to think about how different we live now. We live, you and us, probably, in abstract forms of ethics, that our ethics come from books. They don't come from monitoring the mountain behind the university and considering that as our spirit guide. And every semester, we walk to the top of the mountain to commune with the mountain. We don't do that, typically. Some people do, but uh, it's not a, a common affair. A localized identity we will call pre-axial. Axial is a term by Carl Jaspers. That's the person that we saw on the PowerPoint a while ago. It's a German name. Um, it looks like Jaspers, but it's Jaspers. And Jaspers, in 1959, he wrote a book which looked at world history. And he said, around the world, there's three different regions of the world where our modern ethic systems developed. There's the area of China, Confucianism, as well as Taoism, Mozi, and the area in the era before the first Chinese Empire. There's the area in the modern Middle East where you had uh, Zoroastrianism, and then later you had forms of the Judaic prophets, Judaism, and later Christianity. And you also had context within India, where Buddhism and Jainism developed. They all did this at the same time. This is not widely thought about, but he wondered why. Why did we move from pre-axial to axial religion? He called it axial because axial means a change. What happened in the world that created this change in our religious identity? You know, First, this was our religious identity around the world. Half of the planet was pre-axial until around 1850. There were no state large societies uh, on half of the planet. And now it's completely moving on. Remember I said, by the excerpt, there's still around uh, 250 million indigenous peoples, some of them influenced by axial religions, some of them not. Um, there have been drastic changes in the past 300 years, as those people were the majority, only as recently as then, on land ownership, really. Another way of thinking about this is the thinking of the ethnosphere. This is the state of loss of the world's biodiversity. And biodiversity is tied to the loss of ethnic diversity. This is very similar to what Nathan discussed in Why Some Like It Hot that some people are embedded in the land um, and these people live more sustainable lives. So it's a question, are we successfully adapted? And he would say, no. If you're curious, go to TED.com and you can find Korean subtitles for some of his talks. It's a very good a discussion of pre-axial forms of identity. Here's one link there, TED.com and another link at TED.com. So please, that's also in our syllabus too. Anyway, pre-axial, that these are the ecologically adapted societies, ideologically too, though they're being demoted at a rapid rate. Um, moving on, I'll skip that. Here is, it's hard to see, you can see. see. This is Sing Chu. Sing Chu is an environmental sociologist who's written three books. This is the first of the three books. Um, the first book was called Ecological Degradation, World Ecological Degradation, Accumulation, Urbanization, and Deforestation over 5,000 years. It's a book looking at ecological problems over 5,000 years. Most people argue 
environmental movements are very new, he's saying, well, they're very old. And environmental problems are very old. They're not new. And what he does in the second book is continue this analysis in 2007, recurring dark ages. He looks at the period in world history um, where there were no large states, where states collapsed, and asks the question, what was the ecology like? What was the environment like? And he said, states typically collapse with environmental problems. And um, during these collapses, um, social history calls them dark ages. This is the end of Rome, the end of the Chinese uh, Han Dynasty, um, and earlier periods too. But he says they're bright ages for the environment. These are the centuries that the environment improves. So for large cultural units, it's a decline into smaller groups. But for the environment, it recovers during these periods. And he argued there's three different periods in world history. I'll show you some of his charts of these in a minute. The third book, which summarizes his historical lessons, Ecological Future is What History Can Teach Us, from 2008. Uh, book number one, what's his data? First, he looks at deforestation. He says, looking at forests was easy to do because you could look at pollen. And there's a way to measure pollen in the past much more accurately than other forms of destruction. Well, soil runoff, that's easy to find in sediment that gathers over time. Salinization, levels of salt in the soil, so you can use uh, archaeology data to reconstruct social relationships and pollution. These are themes in the contemporary world, but they're not new to this world, he says. This is a sweeping review of the environmental impacts of human settlement and development worldwide over the past 5,000 years. His ideas are mostly Malthusian. He argues population is a problem. He argues it's intense resource accumulation. And the idea of urbanization encourages environmental problems. Of course, I would disagree with that. And he's probably the only social scientist I know who's Malthusian. Um, there's many critiques of Malthusianism, which I don't have time to get into. But I suggest in our syllabus uh, several critiques of uh, a direct connection of population to environmental issues. Anyway, he looks at ancient and modern societies almost universally bring on ecological disaster, often contribute to the fall of that society. Then it looks at the modern European world system. It's very Eurocentric book too, that's what I don't like. It doesn't have a discussion of East Asia. It doesn't discuss Africa. It's a very Eurocentric view, even though he's you know, Chinese. He also, interestingly, traces the existence of environmental conservation ideas. This is a period of new ideas for environmental protection in the middle of an ecological disaster. Um, using world systems theory, I'll describe that in a minute, as his springboard, Sing Chu develops a social history of the rise and fall of civilizations from the Bronze Age to the emergence of Europe as the center of the world system in the 18th century. 1700s. His thesis is that cultures interact with nature. So it's a nature culture interaction, and their interaction changes both. As nature gets worse, it affects the culture. As the culture changes, it affects the nature. While many social historians you know, talk about famous leaders of different societies, Chu demonstrates how social processes of accumulation, the Marxist term, uh, accelerate the destruction of nature and thus decline of civilizations based on those resources. He uses deforestation as the comparative data, mostly. Um, one major critique, I think, he never, he never asked the question of why population starts to grow. And he never asked the question of how these larger states develop. It just assumes these things as a background. In the second book, he continues the analysis, the recurring dark ages concentrates on specific periods where the whole world system of trading and interstate exchange decline. 
This is connected with significant declines in the stability of the environment. So as trading products decline, states decline, taxation declines, and culture becomes localized. One more time. Typically, um, hundreds of years pass in such dark ages. In the book, he talks about people who looked at this book and they said, what you're describing is a bright age. It's not a truly dark age because you say that the environment, the environment is recovering during this period. Even though human larger society collapses, the environment is recovering. The author's message is that a coming global dark ages is coming, coming, perhaps similar to the past, where human communities will continue to reorganize to meet the contingencies of ecological scarcity and climate change. So he says, this is not just a past, it may be our future. And um, in the third book, he talks about that future and argues that maybe the movement of bioregionalism now is the cultural renewal movement that you see in the past as well, that's connected with a lot of religious movements. So he has a connection to religious movements and environmentalism in the deep past. And why that's interesting is because while he's writing this, I'm not aware of this, and I'm coming to the same conclusion. So this is a test in some way of uh, both of our ideas. I'll skip that. Ethnobotany, the localized frameworks, is another hybrid topic on the local level to study the relationships between plants and people. From ethno, study of people, and botany, study of plants. Ethnobotany is considered a branch of ethnobiology. Ethno. So you can focus on this, how plants have been used, reused, managed, and received in human societies. So it's a cultural interaction of different materials. What I want to do, uh, before I forget, is to show you Sing Chu's uh, graphs. When are these dark ages? It says the geography of dark ages. Um, I'll show you the maps in a minute. But in the global world system, from 200 or 2200 BC to 1700 BC, this period of 500 years, all over the world, Empires collapsed at the same time, in the same period. <clears throat> Where the northwestern India, the Persian Gulf, Mesopotamia, Turkmenistan, Egypt, Greece, Crete, as I said, it's too limited, I think, uh, only to one region of the world. And then there's recovery for 500 years. But again, there's another 500 year period where all over the world, in the Eurocentric sense, Egypt, Crete, Greece, same places collapse again. But this is larger. It's now a larger collapse. There's more area. So some places much longer, 750 onwards. Um, the Iron Age of uh, AD, that means the modern era to 900. These are the European Dark Ages, as well as it describes the period of warfare in Japan, Korea, China. Here's a map of his first dark age. He plotted a lot of data on pollen. Um, half of the book, I don't know if you with me, but half of the book are as an appendix of graphs of pollen you know, within archaeological records. And so they tried to map where the rise and fall of the environment is over a long period of time. And from the first one, it was limited to this area that collapsed. Then it got larger during the next collapse, and the next collapse was bigger, and now you can imagine he's suggesting that if there is going to be another collapse, it will be global in scale because so much, so much of our economy is now tied to this global context. But our economy is still tied to the environment, but now it's tied on a global level. And that's what he uh, talks about. I'll come back to uh, this a little bit later. 